Welcome. I am Dr. Andrew Barker. This is the Mycroft online lecture on Wilfred Owen's Dolce et Decorum Est. This is a First World War poem. For many people, it is the First World War poem, the poem that most brilliantly, most accurately, most informatively sums up the horrors, the fears, the terror of being a combatant, of being a soldier in that particular military engagement. The poem is written in 1918. It is written by a man who soldiered in that war, a man who experienced what he is talking about in the poem itself. The poem's title, Dolce et Decorum Est, is Latin. It's from the Latin poet Horace. And Dolce et Decorum Est means it is sweet and fitting to die for your country. Other translations of this may be it is sweet and right to die for your country or even it is sweet and glorious to die for your country. Now, Owen writes Dolce et Decorum Est at a time when military propaganda to get young men to enlist, to join up and fight, is still going on. The actual horrors of what the soldiers are experiencing on the front lines have not been made fully apparent to the British public at the point when Owen gives the world this particular poem. So Owen is questioning the statement, Dolce et decorum est, property amore, at a time when it is not very popular to have that statement questioned. This is a time when Rupert Brooke's poem the soldier, which can basically be summed up as meaning, if I die, all I want you to think about my death is that I have died for my country. This is a time when that particular sentiment very much sums up the zeitgeist of the time. That is the sentiment which people in power want young British men to feel and think. So Owen's poem here is very much questioning that. This poem is very much an anti-recruitment poem. Now to explain the poem to you, I'll do it in three main sections. I'll read the first stanza and explain that. For the second part, I'll look at the section of the poem between gas gas boys and ecstasy of fumbling and he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. And for the third part, I'll look at the final stanza of the poem. Then, at the end, I'll give you an example of the type of propaganda poetry that Wilfred Owen is addressing in writing Dolce Decorum Est. So this is the first read-through of Wilfred Owen's Dolce et Decorum Est. Make sure you have a copy of the poem in order to annotate as we go through this when I explain the poem to you. Bent double, like old beggars under sacks. Knock kneed, coughing like hags, we cursed through sludge, till on the haunting flares we turned our backs, and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched asleep. Many had lost their boots, but limped on, bloodshod. All went lame, all blind drunk with fatigue, deaf even to the hoots of tired outstripped five nines that dropped behind. Gas, gas, quick boys, an ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time, but someone still is crying out and stumbling, and floundering like a man in fire or lime, dim through the misty panes and thick green light as under a green sea I saw him drowning. In all my dreams, before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smothering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in, and see the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil sick of sin, 
if you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth-corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues. My friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children, ardent for some desperate glory, the old lie, dolce ad decorum est, property amore. That's Wilfred Owen, published 1918. To understand what is going on in the first stanza of this poem, it's helpful to have a diagram of the way the First World War was fought. The First World War was fought through trench warfare. If you look at what we have here, at the top we have the German trenches, the bottom we have the English trenches, and between those is no man's land. The idea behind the trench warfare way of military engagement is that one side would charge the trenches of the others. They would hope not to get mown down by the machine guns which were at the front in the front lines of those trenches and hopefully some of the soldiers would get into the trenches and be able to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat with their enemy, hopefully killing enough of, them, of their enemy in order to overrun the trenches. It was usually done in groups of three. The British soldiers would charge the German machine guns. Hope the first lot, the first line would almost inevitably be mown down. Hopefully some from the second and third lines will be able to get into the trenches in order to wipe out the German soldiers in those trenches. Now, you can imagine being at the front lines in these trenches, and these trenches are waterlogged, rat-infested, freezing cold, hell on earth places. And from these trenches, you're being asked to charge across no man's land to kill your fellow man in the other, in the other trenches. At the point when the poem opens, Wilfred Owen and his troop have done their latest stint on the front lines and they are walking away from the front lines. They are, they are going to be walking along here to come down away from no man's land, away from the trenches to get to their distant rest. Now remember, at the time when this poem is written, the English soldier is thought to be the, or the English soldier is promoted as the clean-limbed young Adonis-like, handsome young man marching off to war for king and country, and happy to do so. Bent double. So straight away we have this image of the soldiers aren't upright young men marching gleefully off to war. They're bent double. They're he describes them as like beggars under sacks. The sacks are presumably their uniforms. Not need. They're in, they, they can't walk properly. They're coughing like hags. Hags are ugly old women. So within the opening lines of the poem, the, the soldiers have been reduced by the reality of warfare from these clean-limbed young men marching off to war to being compared to beggars and ugly old women. Bent double like old beggars under sacks, knock-kneed, coughing like hags, we cursed through sludge. And I, I love this line, cursed through sludge. It's the idea that the, the earth that, that they are walking on, this, this earth that Rupert Brooke was to write off as, if I should die, think only this of me. There is some corner of a foreign field that is forever England. This is that corner of that foreign field. If I, uh, there will be in that rich earth a richer dust concealed. That rich earth and that richer dust is this sludge which he is walking through. We cursed through the sludge. And you get this image of the soldiers and they're, yeah, they're bent double, they're absolutely exhausted, and they're moving through this wet, 
horrible, cursed earth. And they're going, yeah, fucking hell. Fucking God, fuck, I want to do it now. And it's only their, their hatred of the actual earth that they're walking on that's enabling them to move in the first place. Hatred can be a very useful, energising factor. And we, the way he describes it, we cursed through the sludge. Cursed is not a, a verb of movement, but he makes it one here. So I'll read that opening line again. Bent double, like old beggars under sacks, knock knee, coughing like hags, we cursed through sludge. Even the way that you read it is a great example of the form, the way that the poem is written, enhancing what is being written about. It's not written in uh, a sort of jaunty, jolly, iambic pentameter of, if I should die, think only this of me. When you read this, the, the difficulty of reading it is very much like the difficulty of the movement that the soldiers have. It's, it's, al it's almost as if the line is difficult to start up. I imagine reading it like, for some reason, it puts the image of someone trying to start one of those old um, aeroplane engines with it. With, you know, you put the crank in, and you have to start it with like And the soldiers are there, as, you know, bent double, old beggars under sacks, knock knee, coughing like hags, we curse through such. Any way you read this, it's, it is not making their appearance look present. And the way that you say it is not making their movement look easy. Till on the haunting flares we turned our backs and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Note, note that it's trudge, not march. The haunting flares are the flares of no man's land. They can, they'd light up no man's land so the soldiers could see each other to, to kill, to kill each other. Wilfred Owen and his men are walking along the front lines and they've turned their back on the haunting flares of no man's land to get towards their distant rest. So down here they have their time away from the front lines and some well-earned rest. Till on the haunting flares we turned our backs and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched asleep. They're not literally asleep, but they're, they're so exhausted that it's as if they are asleep. Men marched asleep. Many had lost their boots, but limped on, bloodshot. What a fantastic line that is. Okay, many had lost their boots. The, the soldiers haven't got their full uniforms. It literally is what it means. You know, many of the soldiers have lost their boots, but they limp on, bloodshot. And bloodshot is the great phrase here. Bloodshot means, well, we shoe a horse. When we put a shoe on a horse's hoof, we put a metal shoe on. But these soldiers are bloodshot. It's as if they haven't got their own boots, but where they have bled through the soles of their feet, the blood has coagulated and hardened, and it has formed a, a protective coating on the soles of their own feet. The soldiers are bloodshot. And of course, this whole idea of the soldiers uh, being shod in the same way that horses are shod, they've been reduced to animals here. In the, at the start of the poem, Owen has, Owen has reduced the soldiers to, or the reality of the warfare that the soldiers are engaged in has reduced the soldiers to beggars, old hags and animals. What passing bells for those who die as cattle, says Owen in Anthem for Doomed Youth, another one of his poems. Many had lost their boots, but limped on, bloodshod. All went lame. Lame is another word we usually associate with animals. We don't usually talk of humans going lame. All went lame. All blind, drunk with fatigue. When he says they've gone blind, he doesn't literally I mean, they've gone blind, He's, you know, they are, they're so exhausted, they can't see properly. They're so tired, they are drunk with fatigue. This is not the, why, let's go and have a party time of drunk. This is the slumped at the edge of the bar at the end of the evening, so exhausted that you can't remember what you're doing there in the first place type of drunk. Death, even to the hoots of tired, outstripped five nines that dropped behind. 
death they can't hear. The hoots, the hoots of the tired, outstripped five nines that dropped behind. The five nines are a particularly disruptive type of German artillery, uh, a bomb, if you like. And they are now out of the range of the five nines. If you look at the graphic, if you imagine the blue line, that's the trajectory, that's the range that the five nines can reach. So if they're still within that range, they can be killed by the five nines, but they've outstripped the five nines. They've got far enough away so they can't be killed by the five nines anymore. Drunk with fatigue, death, even to the hoots of the tired, outstripped five nines that dropped behind. The hoots, the sound like an owl, it's obviously the sound that the five nine bombs make as they fall behind the soldiers as they turn their backs on the haunting flares of no man's land and get towards their well-earned rest. Now I'll read this opening stanza through one more time and then I'll, I'll show you one of, the, one of the words in this poem that I cannot make myself like. So, the poem starts with, Bent double like old beggars under sacks, not need, coughing like hags, we cursed through sludge, till on the haunting flares we turned our backs and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched asleep. Many had lost their boots, but limped on, bloodshod. All went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue, death even to the hoots of the tired, outstripped five nines that dropped behind. Now the word I don't like there is tired, because literally speaking, a bomb can't be tired. It can't be tired, it can't be enthusiastic. To call a bomb tired is surely actually a bad piece of writing. That particular line was rendered in original drafts of the poem. It wasn't of tired, outstripped five nines that dropped behind. Owen wrote um, of disappointed shells that dropped behind in one of the drafts. And another Another version was, I think, of gas shells dropping silently or softly behind. Of gas shells dropping softly behind. But the line he went with was of tired, outstripped five nines that dropped behind. So he thought it through. But a bomb can't be tired. Literally, a bomb can't be tired. If I want to try and redeem the line, perhaps we could say that the soldier himself is so exhausted that he projects onto his environment so that everything he sees, he sees in the same way that he experiences things himself. So that the bombs are tired in the same way that he is tired. But why I don't like that line is I think it, it can almost be thought of as comic if you're not careful. It's the idea that the bombs could get him if they were not quite so tired. The, bombs come, the bomb comes flying over and the bomb goes, oh, I'm just too tired, I, just, I can't be bothered, I'm too exhausted. And the soldiers only escape because the bombs are too tired to actually get them. And this is not the case. The bombs either get, you are either within the range of the bombs or you are not. So I don't like that line. We'll now come to the second section of the poem, which is the gas attack. The soldiers are out of range of the five nine bombs. They're away from no man's land. They're out of the trenches. And we hear, gas, gas, quick boys, an ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was crying out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime dim through the misty pain and thick green light as under a green sea I see him drowning. In all my dreams before my helpless sight he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. So what has become apparent here is that although the soldiers are out of range of the artillery, they are not out of range of the gas bombs. And there has been a gas bomb attack. 
gas, gas, quick boys, an ecstasy of fumbling. I think this is a terrific line, this, this ecstasy of fumbling. Fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. Plainly, the, the clumsy helmets are the gas masks that the soldiers have to put on to stop themselves breathing in the gas. It's, uh, it's mustard gas that was used in the trenches. The soldiers have got to get their gas masks on. Fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. The ecstasy of fumbling which he speaks of here is the adrenaline rush that invigorates the soldiers, the exhausted bodies of these soldiers who know they've got to get the gas masks on otherwise they're going to breathe in the poisoned gas and die. And they get the helmets and they're trying to, they're trying to put the helmets on and, you know, and they, they can't do it, they're too tired, they're fumbling, this ecstasy of fumbling that they feel, they fit the clumsy helmets just in time. You know, with the, the pumping of adrenaline that would go through you under those, under those conditions. An ecstasy of fumbling. Terrific line. Fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. And if I just draw attention to the word clumsy here, really a, hel a helmet can't be clumsy in the same way that a bomb can't be tired. You can put the, cl the helmet on in a clumsy way, but the helmet itself can't be clumsy. And yet I don't particularly mind that word because a clumsy helmet is, is more an accusation made by the soldier against the helmet. He's having trouble putting the, the helmet on, so he calls the helmet clumsy. That fits in perfectly with uh, the soldier's thought process at this time, I think. But to call the bombs tired seems to have a little too much sympathy for the bombs. Whereas, as I say, to call the helmet clumsy is a nice accusation against the helmet, totally in character of the soldier's thought process. Gas, gas, quick boys, an ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. They just got the helmets on in time to survive the gas attack. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Someone has not managed to get their gas mask on in time. They're calling out. This person is calling out. He's floundering like uh, a fish out of water. Fire and lime are things which burn people. So if you can imagine this man staggering towards Wilfred Owen as if he's on fire, you know, calling out to him floundering like a man in fire and lime, dim through the misty panes and thick green light, as under a green sea I saw him drowning. Now the, uh, the dim panes, dim through the misty panes, the misty panes are the panes of the gas mask. The gas mask would make everything appear to be green. Mustard gas is yellow, but seen through a gas mask, It'll be green. Owen sees his friend come staggering towards him as if, as if he is on fire. And he is unable to help him. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light as under a green sea I saw him drowning. He imagines him drowning on dry land in the poisoned gas, which destroys your lungs, of course. In all my dreams, before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. He can't forget this. By dreams here, of course, he means nightmares. Each dream he has is a nightmare of his friend staggering towards him, guttering, choking, drowning. Guttering is the sound that a, a candle, or the the way that a candle goes out is to gutter. I think that word is used more for its sound than for its actual image. The image of a candle going out is often very beautiful, very serene. I don't think that's what Owen wants to convey. What he wants to convey here is done more by the sound of guttering. Guttering, choking, drowning. So I'll read that gas attack section once more. 
Gas, gas, quick boys, an ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light as under a green sea I saw him drowning in all my dreams before my helpless sight. He plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. And now we come to the final stanza of the poem, which is an extraordinary piece of writing, as if what hasn't gone before isn't extraordinary enough. Owen gives us this. And note how the addressee of the poem changes. Previously, he's just been explaining an incident. Now the poem is specifically addressed to someone, to a you, to a person he later calls my friend. But I'll read it through first and then do the close reading of each line. If in some smothering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil's sick of sin. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth-corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud of vile incurable sores on innocent tongues. My friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory, the old lie, dolce et decorum est, property amore. If in some smothering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in. Obviously, Owen and his fellow soldiers have picked up the soldier who has breathed in the poison gas, and the soldier is not dead yet. So they've picked him up and they've put him in the back of a wagon. I imagine the wagon as you know, a rickety old wooden wagon, you know, old wooden wheels which the soldiers are, are pulling. Owen himself is pacing behind it. Note the word he uses to describe the way the soldiers have placed their wounded comrade in the, in the wagon. Flung him in. If in some smothering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in. They flung him in. They haven't placed him in. They flung him. They know he's going to die. If in some smothering dreams. I love smothering dreams here. Obviously, they're nightmares again that he's talking about, but it's the idea of smothering. Smothering, usually, we use that word to explain a, a fire gets smothered by a blanket. So when something smothers us, it, it takes all the oxygen away, it takes all the life out of us. And it's as if these dreams, these nightmares that Owen has had, has, they've smothered the life out of him. And he's, he's saying to the person he's addressing the poem to, if in some smothering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in. Owen's pacing behind the wagon, looking at his, looking at this wounded soldier in the wagon in front of him. And he says, if you could watch the white eyes writhing in his face. It's as if the, the pupils and irises of his eyes have just shot up. You know, they're writhing around like that. They're, if you wanted to be very pedantic about it, um, eyes can't really writhe. But we know exactly what it means. If there was a situation where an eye could writhe in the agony usually associated with the human body and not just the eye, this would be it. And watch the white eyes writhing in his face his hanging face, like a devil's sick of sin. His hanging face, presumably Owen means a face that looks like someone who's just been hung. I tend to imagine that his hanging face, rather like um, Edvard Munch's uh, painting The Scream. That it's, it's that picture that I see when I, I hear his hanging face, like a devil's sick of sin. Like a devil sick of sin may be even more difficult to imagine. What, what does the face of a devil who is sick of sin look like? I get the idea when I hear that line, if the devils, the devil which is responsible for all evil of the, in the world is watching this and it's just saying, I'm just sick of this. This is too disgusting. Even I've got a line. To me, it's more prescriptive of the way the devil feels about what's actually going on. This is just disgusting. I'm sick of it. 
any way you try to imagine the idea of the face of a devil that is sick of sin, the idea of a hanging face, the idea of white eyes writhing within a face, any way you imagine those images, it is not going to be something pleasant that your mind concocts. And after that, we come to, for me, two of the most acoustically powerful lines in poetry that I'm aware of. If there's a better line for conjuring up acoustically the horrors of someone choking to death, I don't know what it is. Listen to this. The, the sound that this line actually makes and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil sick of sin. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud, the vile incurable sores on innocent tongues. If you could hear at every jolt, so as the wagon comes away from the trenches, we can assume it's going to jolt quite often. Eh? Jolt, jolt, jolt. And every time it jolts, Wilfred Owen hears the blood come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs. That's what the mustard gas attack has done to his friend. His lungs are corrupted. There's froth within them. The blood that's coming from his mouth, the blood's come gargling from froth corrupted lungs. In fact, it doesn't come from his mouth, it comes all the way from his lungs. Fantastic line. Obscene as cancer which I have to say I don't particularly like. I don't like it because obscene as cancer seems to me to be a lazy simile now. Whether or not uh, it was a lazy simile in 1918 is a different matter completely. But obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud of vile incurable sores on innocent tongues. Now cud is what a cow chews when it regurgitates its food. And Partially, for me, this line achieves uh, the idea of Owen keeps regurgitating the image. He can't get rid of the picture of his friend staggering towards him, guttering, choking, drowning. But bitter as the cud of vile incurable sores on innocent tongues. The vile incurable sores on innocent tongues conjures up an image of syphilis to me. That, that was how syphilis presented itself. These vile incurable sores on innocent tongues. And it's innocent meaning sexually inexperienced. The unfairness of the, the, boy, the sexually inexperienced boy dying of syphilis. The bitterness, the unfairness of it. Bitter as the cud of vile incurable sores on innocent tongues. And of course the soldiers who are in this war can be seen as innocent, they don't really know what they're doing, they're not experienced at life, they're young, very young men fighting this war. Obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud, a vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues. Then Owen says, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory. The old lie, dolce e decorum est property amore. My friend, we'll come back to who that my friend is later. My friend, you would not tell with such high zest. Zest is keenness, enthusiasm. My friend, you would not be so keen to tell. Children, ardent for some desperate glory. Children who want to be heroes. That's what ardent for some desperate glory means. Keen to be a hero. Owen, Owen is saying, if you have seen what I have seen, you would not be so keen to tell young men, kids, who want to be heroes, it is sweet and fitting, glorious, right to die for your country. Because I have seen those young men dying for our country and there is nothing fitting right or glorious about it. It's worth noting what Owen actually asks you to do here in this final stanza, which is one sentence, incidentally. 
In that final stanza, he doesn't ask you to imagine what it is like to be the soldier who breathes the mustard gas. He doesn't ask you what it is like to be one of those soldiers who is dying for his country. All he asks you to do is be him, is be the person who has watched one of his friends dying for his country. Be the person who has heard the blood come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs. He doesn't say see the blood come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs in that line either. He says if you can hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs. In the act of attempting to hear it, we inevitably see it as well. What Owen asks the addressee of the poem to do here it shows a lot of integrity. He's not asking the person he addresses the poem to to do anything that he hasn't done himself. So of course the question now must be raised, who is he addressing the poem to? Now there's another Mycroft online lecture which we've done on Rupert Brooke's pre-First World War poem The Soldier. And The Soldier was a very popular poem, as I mentioned at the start, for recruiting young men to warfare. And it was very successful for that. And it would be very apt if Wilfred Owen was addressing the Rupert Brooke who wrote The Soldier in this poem. It would be very apt, but in fact he's not. The poem was originally addressed to a woman called Jessie Pope. It was later addressed to, to a certain poetess. And Jessie Pope was a woman who wrote very patriotic uh, verses. The, the sort of woman who would hand out white feathers to young men to go and encourage them to get their limbs blown off in the trenches of Flanders. If we wanted to be kinder to the type of propaganda which was believed in and expounded by people like Jesse Pope, perhaps we could argue that before poems like Dulce et Decorum Est get written, they actually don't know what the reality of the First World War trenches is. Until brave young men like Wilfred Owen experience the horrors of that existence and have talent enough to write about it and bring these horrors back for the public to read and understand, perhaps it could be argued that the propaganda machine at the start of the First World War literally thought that what they were saying was the truth. And perhaps it could be argued that they didn't as well. I'll finish by reading Jesse Pope's early First World War recruitment poem, Who's for the Game? This is the type of poem that seems to see warfare as some sort of overzealous rugby match. So I'll read this out and then read you for the final time Wilfred Owen's Dulcia de Coronest. Who's for the game, the biggest that's played, the red crushing game of a fight? Who'll grip and tackle the job unafraid? And who thinks he'd rather sit tight? Who'll toe the line for the signal to go? Who'll give his country a hand? Who wants a turn to himself in the show? And who wants a seat in the stand? Who knows it won't be a picnic, not much, yet eagerly shoulders a gun? Who would much rather come back with a crutch than lie low and be out of the fun? Come along, lads, but you'll come on all right, for there's only one course to pursue. Your country is up to her neck in a fight, and she's looking and calling for you. Jesse Pope, 1915. Now, as the antidote to this, we get Wilfred Owen's Dossier de Coramis. And let's remember that Wilfred Owen was not what we might call a pacifist. Wilfred Owen was a full-on soldier in that war. Wilfred Owen elected to go back to the front lines at the end of the war to see the war through to the end. 
And when Owen returns to fight at the, on the front lines, he's killed. He dies in the final week of warfare. He dies almost one week to the, to the hour before the final armistice. So when this genuine military hero says this about the act of warfare, the realities of warfare, this is somebody we have to listen to. This is someone saying that if you're going to be sending young men out to fight, let's make you sure you understand the realities of what's actually going on there. And he does it through this poem. Bent double like old beggars under sacks, not need, coughing like hags we cursed through sludge, till on the haunting flares we turned our backs and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched asleep. Many had lost their boots, but limped on bloodshod. All went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue, deaf even to the hoots of tired, outstripped five nines that dropped behind. Gas, gas, quick boys, an ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still is crying out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime, dim through the misty panes and thick green light as under a green sea I saw him drowning. In all my dreams, before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smothering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in, and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil as sick of sin. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud of vile incurable sores on innocent tongues, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory the old lie, dolce et decorum est, property amore. Let me just mention one more thing about the, the end of that poem. The final line of it, the, the old lie, it is sweet and glorious to die for your country. The poem, in, the poem itself is more or less written in iambic pentameter, more or less. And the final lines of it, my friend you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory. The old lie dolce e decorum est, property amore. Don't we miss something at the point when he says property amore? To children ardent for some desperate glory, the old lie dolce e decorum est, property amore, dum dum dum. And I thought for a long time why Owen ended the poem in the way that he does like that. And the conclusion I've come to is that it works as if Owen has turned his back on the natural rhythm of the poem in the same way that he has turned his back on the old lie that is Dolce e decorum est property amore. So we hear, my friend you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory, the old lie dolce et decorum est, property amore. And Owen turns away, leaving the dum 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 that we expect to follow the sentiment behind. That was the Mycroft online lecture for Wilfred Owen's Dolce et decorum est. I am Dr. Andrew Barker. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.